I was asked in the uh, last talk to tell you some of the work we're doing on synthetic life, sort of the interface between the computer world and the biological world. Uh, we reported our first uh, preliminary uh, results, uh, the proof of concept uh, last April uh, in science. And how did we get here? So we, we've had sort of like 34 years now of reading the genetic code. And when we read that genetic code, in my view, we're digitizing biology. So from the first virus in uh, 77 to the first, uh, first uh, bacterial genome that we did in 1995, the first human genome in 2000, all that gets encoded into the ones and zeros in the computer. And our challenge for so many reasons of understanding this information, uh, proving biological concepts, getting down to minimal cells, et cetera, has been to now try and go in the other direction. And as soon as we made the decision uh, 15 years ago to try and get to synthetic life, there were two major problems. First, could we synthesize DNA at the size and the accuracy needed uh, to get to biological self-replicating life? And the other challenge was even if we made this DNA, uh, could we boot it up in a cell and have it be biologically active? So the problem with this field is DNA synthesis is pretty crappy. The machines that make DNA uh, make errors. It's an N minus one situation with the longer the oligonucleotide, the more errors. So in this study in, in 2003 that uh, was done with my colleagues Ham Smith and Clyde Hutchinson, uh, the co-directors of this program with me, we made a genome uh, of a small virus, Phi-X-174, and with new methods for error correcting uh, these synthetic uh, DNA errors. The exciting stage, we took this 5,000 letter molecule and injected it into E. coli. E. coli recognized the synthetic DNA and started manufacturing the viral proteins. Those proteins self-assembled, made the virus, and we could detect it by these clear plaques on the plate because the virus showed its gratitude by killing the cells that made it. Uh, it's somewhat like graduate school. Uh, <laughs> so we call this a situation where the software builds its own hardware. All we did was chemically make the software, put it in a cell, the cell synthesized the virus. Now we didn't want to make a virus, we actually wanted to make a complete bacterial genome so the second genome that we did in history was this species, uh, Mycoplasma genitalium. It has the smallest genome of a self-replicating organism. It has on the order of about 500 genes. So we spent years trying to see which genes we could eliminate to get to minimal life, but we decided that the complexity of making the DNA would be the hard part, so we chose the smallest genome. We knew because we could make viral size pieces accurately that we could make lots of those and try and put those together to make the bacterial chromosome. So we started with these cassettes on the order of viruses, five to 7,000 letters, and we set up a process for assembling those in stages, making larger and larger pieces. Sort of looks like a basketball playoff. At each stage, we would take the DNA, we'd clone it in E. coli, make a lot of it, and sequence it for validation, and then take those pieces and assemble in the next stage to make the next larger pieces. Uh, it was very slow, uh, painstaking work. The problem was when we got over 100,000 letters in size, E. coli wasn't too happy taking these really large pieces of DNA. So we looked around for some different systems. We'd been looking at uh, self-correction and self-assembly of DNA. This is an organism, Deinococcus radiodurans, that can take three million rads of radiation and not be killed. Its chromosome gets blown apart, as you can see in the top panel, but after 12 to 24 hours, it stitches its genome back together exactly as it was before, and it starts replicating again. We have lots of organisms on this planet that can take these huge doses of radiation, and now we have uh, these organisms uh, circulating in near space uh, from flushing the commodes on the space station, um, something they stopped doing. Uh, it turns out brewer's yeast has the same remarkable abilities of reassembling DNA. And we found by simply putting these large synthetic pieces together, designed so they overlap, 
with a synthetic yeast centromere. So the big difference between the prokaryotes and eukaryotes turns out to be the centromere that allows them to grow in the eukaryotic nucleus. And we just inject these in the yeast, and yeast automatically assemble these into the complete bacterial genome. So this is what we reported in 2008. It was the first complete bacterial genome uh, that was synthesized. But the problem was we couldn't boot it up. This is a, an extremely slow-growing organism. Uh, and through these process of improving the chemistry, uh, for example, Dan Gibson developed a single pot reaction. We put in three enzymes at a single temperature. We just throw in the small pieces of DNA with the right design and they assemble into larger pieces. We demonstrated this recently by synthesizing uh, the mouse mitochondrial uh, genome using this one pot reaction. Uh, soon there'll be kits available and uh, hopefully uh, in the not too distant future, robots to do this without human intervention. Because now we can go right from the digital code in the computer to these assemblages uh, and possibly a ride into biology. So how do we boot up a synthetic chromosome? So we had teams working in parallel on this. Uh, and uh, this, I think, is one of the most profound studies we published, whereby swapping out the genetic code in a cell, we completely converted one species into another. And because this is so important, let me walk you through that. So there's two mycoplasma species that we use. M. mycoides, we isolated the chromosome from it. We treated it harshly to remove any proteins because for synthesis, we wanted to prove you could just work with naked DNA. Uh, we added a couple extra genes to that chromosome so it would turn cells bright blue and so we could select for it. And we injected this into a second uh, mycoplasma species, uh, Capricolum. These are about the same distance apart as human and mice in terms of a genetic code. And we have this very sophisticated movie to show you what we think uh, happened. So we injected the new chromosome into the cell. And now briefly we have a Capricolum cell with two sets of instructions. As with the viral DNA, the new DNA started to be read. And some of the early proteins produced were restriction enzymes. This is what my colleague Ham Smith discovered and got the Nobel Prize for in 1978 that's allowed this whole field to go forward. We think these enzymes recognize the parent chromosome in the cell as foreign DNA and shoot it up. So now we have a cell of one species, a cytoplasma of the Capricolum, and the genetic instructions from mycoides. In a very short while, we had these bright blue cells, and when we interrogated them, all the Capricolum proteins were gone, replacing completely everything with the new driven by the new genetic instructions that made mycoides proteins. So simply by swapping out the software, we converted one species into another. Uh, many people wish you could do this with a computer, that you could put a, uh, a piece of software in a PC and turn it into a Macintosh. Or, or, uh, that, that would be a commercial hit, I'm sure. Uh, so, we now had a model that would work for transplantation. And to test this, because we are now assembling the genomes in yeast, we had a new problem. We had to get the bacterial chromosome out of a eukaryote and transplant it back into a bacteria. Uh, and so we developed techniques to clone complete bacterial genomes in yeast just by adding the synthetic yeast uh, centromere. Uh, and these genomes seem to be stably maintained. So now we had a system for testing, can we take the bacterial chromosome out of the eukaryote and transplant it into another bacteria? And we ran into a major problem. It, it didn't work. Uh, this took us uh, about two years of 25 people to solve this, and it turned out to be these same restriction enzymes and processing of the DNA. When we did the initial transplant experiments taking the DNA out of the mycoides cells, Turns out that DNA was methylated, and that actually protected it from the restriction enzymes in the cell, uh, but why its enzymes could work on the other DNA. So we found if we isolated all the restriction enzyme genes and the methylases and methylated the DNA, uh, then we could transplant that chromosome and make the new species. 
And we ultimately proved it by removing the restriction enzyme genes from the recipient cell, and then we could just use naked, unmethylated DNA. So at this stage, we're totally confident that it would work. I made predictions that we'd have it in a short period of time, uh, and we ran into another problem uh, before we get to this publication. We had one error out of over a million letters in genetic code that prevented the synthetic uh, chromosome from being booted up. We actually had to develop new biological software for decoding our synthetic DNA. Uh, and finally, we found a single letter missing out of an essential gene. Once we corrected that, we were then able to transplant the completely synthesized mycoides genome. So we use these new synthesis techniques uh, to go back and synthesize the complete chromosome very quickly, just starting with the digital code in the computer. So this is the first cell that actually has, as its parent, its genetic parent, the computer. And to prove this, because we wanted to make sure we couldn't get into troubles with contamination of a single molecule of DNA, we've learned various ways to watermark the DNA, inserting things in the genetic code. In fact, the top line here, and if you had uh, maybe somebody in the audience or some of the ones that solved this, is we had a code within the genetic code uh, that gave uh, another code. And if you decoded that, you could actually read in the English language uh, various things that we wrote in the genetic code, including the, the names of 46 scientists that contributed uh, uh, to this working. And you can see we added a few quotations uh, from the literature, uh, one from James Joyce. You think you get away with anything, uh, he, he's dead. Um, his estate called and said, you use that quotation without paying us. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we ran into some problems there. Um, and then uh, relative to today is uh, the quote from Richard Feynman that we got off the internet. Uh, and then we got a letter from uh, a professor here at Caltech, Mike Gottlieb, uh, saying that Feynman never said that. Um, and sent us, uh, and we're grateful for it, sent us the uh, correct quote off his uh, blackboard. Uh, uh, what I cannot uh, create, I do not understand. So we're going back now and changing the genetic code uh, to, <laughs> to, 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 to get his quote uh, correct. Uh, the other thing in that genome is a web address for people that deconvoluted the information could send an email address. So this is the first species on the planet to have its own website uh, built in <laughs> to its genetic code. So on the order of what you've heard today, th this is a fairly complex machine. These are uh, all the genes, uh, uh, the instructions uh, for making the species. It's not a very interesting species, but this is a proof of concept. We now know it works. We have the control experiment. And we think that now we're limited only by our imagination. These are actually pictures of the cell. It's gone through over a billion self-replications and will go on uh, forever if it's fed well. So, this new field of synthetic genomics, I, I kind of liken to the electronics industry in the 40s and 50s, where there was only a few handfuls of components for design of everything we have now. With biology, currently, just from our discovery from our ocean voyage, we have over 40 million genes in the database. I view these as the design components of the future. Within a decade, that number will probably be on the order of 200 million. We're not short of design features. We actually have software synthetic genomics for designing software for designing new cells and new species. So this is an era now that these preliminary first experiments have worked that tell us anything uh, is possible uh, going forward. In fact, we have to use what we've called combinatorial genomics to put these together in a robotic fashion because there's not enough scientists, given every scientist on the planet working on even the 40 million genes designed to date, discovered to date, we can understand uh, their function. When we announced the first synthetic cell, we got an immediate response from both the Pope and the President. <laughs> uh, I think that's a first in history. Um, and I was not invited to a barbecue. I was pleased uh, with that. Uh, and, uh, it, 
<laughs> but the president asked uh, his new bioethics commission to take this on as their first task, and they just issued their report. I think they did a terrific job creating a careful balance uh, between public safety and moving science uh, forward. So if we look forward to this next 50 years, this is going to be a very exciting era because almost anything in anybody's imagination can be designed and made as a biological unit. Now, we're not working at the atom scale, but you can get roughly a third of all the humanity's genomes within the proverbial head of a pin. Uh, you can get 10 to the 12 of these synthetic genomes. So it's a pretty small scale, but we can work now by changing evolution, by building on top of it, simply by designing new software of life. Thank you very much.